morning, John. Be it the Father's will, because it's certainly my will, we're going to finish up the story of Lazarus today. And so you will remember, um, Yeshua gets the word, Lazarus is very sleep. he's sick, he says he's sleeping, they say, oh, if that's the case, whatever. He's like, no, he's dead, guys, and they're like, okay, well, it's dangerous for him to go back. Uh, people are looking for him, for Yeshua, but he's going back anyway. He goes and he meets Martha. I'm making sure I'm right here. Martha, yeah, Martha meets him outside and away because she doesn't want uh, people to know he's there. Kind of a little clandestine meeting going on. And then, now Jesus, verse 30 of John 11, Jesus, Yeshua, was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. And the Jews which were with her, this is Mary, with Mary, in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily. They went out and followed her saying, she goes unto the grave to weep there. Now here's the deal. Has anybody here ever seen, whether that's on video or in person, a Middle Eastern funeral? What they did, and I don't know if Jews do this today, I don't think they do. I think they left that in the Middle East culture, but in the Middle East they do this. When, when somebody dies, they actually hire professional whalers to come. <laughs> and they just do that because it's like considered a sign of a great person if all these people are wailing for them. And so these people show up and they just wail and it would drive me nuts. I'd be like, hey, this person I care about has gone to glory. Get thee gone. Shut up. You drive me crazy. Let's have a drink, you know, or whatever. But, um, so there's these professional, and I say professional. It could be, Brother Tristan, you're such a good whaler. Could you come to the funeral uh, on Tuesday, you know, and, and so they would do that, right? They, whether they were paid or not, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, these people said, hey, she's going to the grave to weep there, verse 32, and when Mary was come where Yeshua was, she saw him, and she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Master, if you had been here, my brother had not died. And then she's crying, right? Because she's like, well, if you'd only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So she loves her brother. She knows the power of Yeshua, and she's sad. And so she's crying, ouch. Something bit me. And when Jesus, Yeshua, therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Who has a different word than groaned in his spirit? I have a note, angry underneath This word is only used twice in the Bible, and it, the word in Greek, it doesn't really have a, a direct correlation to English, but it means like a snort, like a horse snorts, like, and he's doing it in anger. It's like anger and frustration that Yeshua is doing that, um, that he sees her troubled like that. Why do you think he's mad? I mean, there's someone he obviously cares about who cares about him. She's crying. Lazarus is his friend. She's crying for him pretty normal human reaction. Someone you love dies, you cry. So why is he mad? Irritated. Greatly. Annoyed. They don't have faith that he can do anything. About that death has reign in this world. That's what it is. Because death is still out there and it's hurting the people that Yeshua loves and cares about. And he feels like in best Bill Clinton fashion. No, I'm not going to compare our Messiah to Bill Clinton. He feels their pain, though, like he really does, right? And he's like, wow, this is horrible. And he's angry. He's disgusted that this death is reigning right now and is taking people and making people feel like this. And so he says, hey, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Master, come and see. And Jesus wept. And I added the and. Shortest verse in the Bible. It's the joke. Have you memorized any scripture? Yes, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. <laughs> it's also used in some cultures, I think Catholic, as like a phrase, Jesus wept. And it just means, wow, that's sad, or that's bad, or that's terrible. You'll hear people say, they say it on movies, Jesus wept. 
It's usually some like old worldly kind of ethnic woman, like, you know, Irish or something. Um, when you see it in movies, Jesus wept, but people say that like that. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. And then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. They just noticed that Yeshua loved Lazarus, and, and so that's what they're saying. And some of them said, Here we go, the human nature. Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Scoffers, right? I mean, that's really what they are. It's like, pff, big guy. That's his friend, huh? He's healed the blind. Couldn't he have saved his friend? If you think about how blasphemous that, that is about the way they're looking at the Messiah. Um, but that's human nature. I, you know, unfortunately, and I'm not comparing myself to Yeshua. I'm just taking the example of what's going on there. I'll do a video on something, and some of the comments I read are just outrageous on there. And it's, I, I just look at, I just delete them. I don't answer them anymore. But it's just like there are scoffers out there who will look at something good and they've just got to trash it somehow. So that's what they're doing. He's healed the blind. Can he have healed his friend? And Jesus, Yeshua, therefore groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone was laid in front of it. And Yeshua said, take away the stone. I like this part. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said to him, Master, by this time he stinks, for he's been dead four days. Remember, was, I'll just say it again, I'm not sure who was here. The Jews at that time had a thing that someone who was dead for three days, up to three days, their spirit still lingered. And so could conceivably come back into the body. But after four days, they know he's dead because the body starts stinking. Right, And so that is the purpose that Yeshua waited for four days because he didn't want anyone to say, well, yeah, he really wasn't dead. You know, he did some mumbo jumbo, and, but he really wasn't dead. So he's waiting for four days. But one of the reasons they know the body is really dead at four days is because it starts to stink. Has anybody here ever smelled a dead human body? You're lucky. Go on, dog. And Yeshua said to her, Said I not unto thee that if thou would believe, thou would see the glory of God, the esteem of Elohim? So she's like, hey, you don't want to do that. He's going to stink. And he's like, ah, 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 where's your faith? Didn't I tell to you if you believe you're going to see something pretty cool? And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Yeshua lifted up his eyes. So he's looking up to the heavens. And he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that you heard me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that you have sent me. It's kind of like Yeshua's telling us the Father, Yah. How does God pray to himself? It's beyond our human understanding how that happens, right? But he's saying to the Father, Hey, I know we have 100% perfect communication here. I'm just really saying this prayer so all these people can hear that I'm giving you the glory for what's about to happen. See, Yeshua is not taking the glory for what's about to happen. He's saying, Hey, you heard me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. It says, come forth. Lazarus, come out. I love the way Yeshua heals. Dog, get. There's no long prayer. There's no, oh, Father, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, hey, Lazarus, come out. He's full of confidence that he has the power of Yah flowing through him. And so he just does it. I think we can take a lesson from that. We're going we're gonna to kind of talk about some of this in, in a little bit. Um, it's not magic it's the pure power of Yah. It, I was talking to, I think, Sam the other day. When I pray, I'm pretty direct and straightforward. And I only say things once. Because I figure the Father heard me the first time. 
and he's either going to do it or not. And so I don't need to say it a thousand times, heal Sister Kate's ankle. Father, I know that she's a good sister and you love her, Father, and she's trying her best to serve you, Father. So if you could just reach down, Father, reach down right now and heal her ankle, Father. Heal her ankle. And they on and on and on and on. It's a nice show, but that's not required. All you have to say is, Father, heal her ankle. Jesus' name. Boom. It's either going to happen or it's not. Take a lesson from Yeshua. He says, Lazarus, come on out. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. So he's in what they buried him in, and I guess they wrapped some kind of dressing around the face um, for, for dead people, almost kind of like a mummy, but not mummified. And Yeshua, I mean, can you imagine Lazarus? Actually, he's laying there, he's in like this shroud or something, he's got this thing around his head, it says he's got stuff around his feet, and he's like... <laughs> coming out you know it's like well i can probably see a little bit of light through his bandage or something and he's like come to the light <laughs> he's coming to the front of the cave and wow i guess i'm just in that mood today there's a monty python movie where they're trying to get this this guy who picks up the dead bodies from the black plague he comes right and says bring out your dead bring out your dead and they bring the dead bodies throw them on a cart and he takes them away to be dealt with because you can't have stinking dead bodies after four days laying around your place and so the guy says to the, to the cart man, hey, uh, this is my grandfather or something. He's going to be, you only come on Tuesdays and he's going to be dead by the day after tomorrow for sure. So can you take him now? And the guy's like, no, man, we don't, we don't do that. And the guy's like, I'm not dead yet. And he goes, oh yeah, but he's going to be dead by tomorrow. He goes, I feel chipper. I feel healthy. And, and so that's the story. But I kind of picture Lazarus like coming out. Hey, 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 I'm not dead. You know, I'm alive. Don't, don't close that thing. Don't close it back up. And Yeshua said, loose him and let him go. Do you also notice that Yeshua doesn't say another big speech? Behold the glory of the Most High Yah as Lazarus comes forth. I mean, he's not doing that. He's like, hey, you guys untie him. Let's go. It's done. It's over. We're good. The, the action speaks for itself that that's happened. He doesn't have to add to it. So Yeshua says, loose him and let him go. And then many of the Jews which came to Mary and seen the things which Yeshua did, they believed on him because the proof is in the pudding and they see it and they believe. But, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and they told them the things that Yeshua had done. Now the fact that there's a but in there means they don't really believe that Yeshua did it, and if they do believe, they think it's a bad thing, and so they're basically tattletaling on Yeshua to the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees at this point don't know he's there, but they're about to find out when these guys go and tell. 47. And then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and they said, Has anybody seen Jesus Christ Superstar? This is a scene in Jesus Christ Superstar. What do we? This man does many miracles. If we let thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place as the leaders and the nation. The Romans are allowing these guys, these high priests and Pharisees and Sadducees and stuff, to remain in power only so long as they support the Roman government. They're like stooges. They are like shills for the Roman government. And they know that the minute they can't keep a lid on things, the Romans are going to come in and go, you guys aren't in charge anymore. And martial law, the bad way, is going to be implemented. So as long as you guys can keep it together and keep your people under control, we're good. And so the, the, these uh, high priests, they have two things going on. One is, we really don't want the Romans to come in and put the sword out and be the bad kind of martial law for our people. We're the leaders of our people and we want that. But they also have the, we don't want to be removed from power, right? Also, where is their power anymore if Yeshua is Messiah? 
If Yeshua is Messiah that's been long foretold that's coming here, they're going to lose their power. Right? So this is no bueno. So they're kind of lying to themselves about what their real motivations are. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You don't know anything. You know nothing at all. Nor consider, you're not even considering, that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. It's that moral dilemma. I'm going to come back to that, but I want to finish this little speech. And he spake not of himself, but of being high priest that year. He prophesied. Because, see, the Jews believed that anything that the the high priest said counted as prophecy. Because he's the high priest, when he says it, it's important. It's kind of like the Pope. It's kind of like people try to put on President Trump. They hate his tweets, right? They hate his tweets, one, because he gets a message out that the media is not controlling. They also hate his tweets because does anybody here think that every now and then he's tweeted something that he probably thought in the morning, "Ah, I probably shouldn't have said it that way. I mean, I have, right? Um, I I know that his his people around him are like, no, we're going to have to walk that one back somehow, right? Um, but here to four, it's like the president really can't say anything once he's president that doesn't have deep meaning and importance. I mean, God forbid the president say, you know, I really like Keystone Light. <gasps> he's, he's doing that over this and he's done an endorsement. It's like, no, man, I'm a dude. I like Keystone Light. You know, whatever. I mean, so, but for the high priest, they believe that whatever he said uh, spoke for the nation. And not for that nation only. But that also he should gather, he, the Messiah, should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And from that day forth, they took counsel for to put him to death. It's that moral dilemma. Come on. Doesn't it make sense that this one guy, Jesus, we take care of him, He gets put to death, and that saves the whole nation. They do that on that show 24. They do it in movies every now and then. It's the the moral dilemma. Sister Kate and I were watching something the other day on the Jews in somewhere. Sobibor. Sobibor. It was a death camp. They killed a couple hundred thousand people there. Um, At one point, there's an escape attempt. They get captured. They catch the 16 guys who were trying to escape, and they line them up, and then they tell each one of those guys to pick one more person because we're going to kill 32 people. And they said, no, we're not picking anybody. And they said, okay, that's good. If you don't pick anybody, we're going to pick 10 people for every one of you. So pick one person. That's like playing that game. What's that game called? Conflicted? There you are. Y'all forbid I'm giving these words no power. Lined up. And they say, you got to pick another person to also be shot with you, and if you don't, we're going to pick ten people. What would you do? Don't answer that question. You should think about it, though. Because I told Sister Kate, I can answer these dilemma questions easy. I wouldn't pick anybody. (gasps) But if you don't pick one person, they're going to kill ten. I'm not killing anybody. They're the bad guy. They want to kill 10 people. That's between them and the Father. I am not saying, all right, Brother Tristan, I love you like a brother, but you got to get shot today. Not doing it. I refuse to play their game. That's the moral dilemma, and that, that, that it's like a moral dilemma game. They play it all the time. If we throw this one person off the life raft, we're all on a life raft. We're starting to sink. If we throw one person off, we'll all live. What do you do? If you're thinking about throwing a person off, you're going to have to throw me off because I'm not going to let anybody throw anybody off the raft. We're going to hang, we're here in the raft. We're going to hang out in the raft. Um, don't fall for that moral dilemma. But that's what that's what he's talking about here. Hey, one guy for the whole nation. It's worth it. So Yeshua raised Lazarus from the dead, right? Were there any other raisings from the dead in the word? Yes. Somebody name one. There's a little 12 year old girl in a house somewhere. And I think it's. The guy that falls out of a building. Yeah. Right. The guy that falls on. Uh, so the guy that fell out of the building. 
Paul's preaching, right? Laid into the night, and this guy tumbles off and onto the flagstones, and he's dead. Um, that's an Acts 9.20. We're not going there. His name was Eutychus. Who raised him from the dead? God. What? God. God did, really, right? God always does. Who was, like, the communicator? Arise! It was Paul. And so, Paul raised... Allow me that. Paul raises somebody from the dead. Yeshua raises three people that we read about from the dead. He does the boy who's going by in, in the coffin, and he just reaches over and touches it, and then the boy comes alive. And if you're taking notes, that's in Luke 7.13. And then he does um, the daughter of Jairus. Mm -hmm. He raises her from the dead. That's Matthew 9.25. And then, of course, here's Lazarus um, that we're discussing. New Testament Paul. Do you guys remember Tabitha? Mm -hmm. Do you remember who raised Tabitha from the dead? It wasn't Jesus. It's Peter. So Peter raises Tabitha. That's Acts 9.36. So, so in Acts 9.20, there's Paul. In 9.36, there's um, Peter. Peter. We can read in Matthew 27.52 that when Yeshua was crucified, people rose from the grave. So they were dead, and they rose. That's how we know Yeshua is the first fruits of many. right? That, that was foretelling that. What about Old Testament? Elijah. Yeah, Elijah and Elisha. So, and this is kind of interesting. I just learned this um, this week. So Elijah, 1 Kings 17, 17, he raises a boy from the dead. Right, the boy's dead and he rides him. Do you remember when Elisha said, I want double the honor yeah. of you? Mm -hmm. So Elisha, he raises the Shumanite woman's son. That's in 2 Kings 4.35. But then this one I had forgotten about. Because he asked for double the honor. Well, he only raised one kid. He dies. And his bones are being carried. And are down in this cave. And they lower this guy down to touch his... It, they lower his dead body down to touch Elisha's bones. And he's like, hey, lift me up. I'm okay. Right? And so... Uh, through Elisha, right? We know that Yah, that Yah does it all, but it, it's just kind of interesting that that happened. Um, and so it's not just that the point I wanted to make is it's not just Yeshua that has raised people from the dead. Granted, it's all Yah, but he has used not just Yeshua, Peter and Paul. And it's easy for us to think, okay, Peter and Paul, they're pretty important guys, right? You know, they, they've got all the power of Yeshua with them. Um, Elisha and Elijah, no one's going to doubt that um, they have, you know, they're doing things for the Father. Um, what about us? Can we raise somebody from the dead? And again, realizing it's the Father doing it, but if somebody's dead, could you go up there and say, rise, live? I know that my first elder at Round Prairie Community Church, his dad was a pastor. And he died in the pulpit. He had a heart attack or a stroke or something. One of those two. <clears throat> There's a nurse in the congregation that runs up and they're dealing with him and she does her nurse stuff and he's dead. The elders say everybody lay hands on him. They laid hands on him and prayed on him and he lived. He came back. I think it's easy for a skeptical mind to go, she was an incompetent nurse. She couldn't tell if the guy was dead or not. I think she probably could. And I think he was probably raised from the dead. And so I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, if I saw somebody die, because I always put myself in the place of what I'm telling y'all. If I saw somebody die, would I immediately go over there and say, Arise! In Jesus' name. And then I thought, no. Not unless I get a strong unction from the Holy Spirit to do it. I mean, I'd have to get that, go over there and do this thing. Because people die in great numbers. Believers die in great numbers. It's the Father's will that they do so. 
we think death is horrible because it's like we're, we're operating in this physical realm right now, but he's like, hey, you're done. Come on. You know, you've, you've done your, your hard time on earth. Come on up here and check this out kind of thing. Um, and so, but if I did get that unction, I would do it. Please turn to Mark chapter 16, last chapter in Mark. End of the chapter. Pick up in 16.14. So Yeshua died. He rose again. And he comes back, right? Which is interesting to me. Our semantics, our English language. We're waiting on the second coming of Christ. We all can make a pretty good case where we find Yeshua in the Old Testament, right? And then we have Yeshua walking the earth. And then he dies. And he's gone. He's risen. He's not here. Right? And then he comes back for a few weeks. Is that not the second coming? Well, no, that was tied to his first time here. I'm like, yeah, but he left and he came back. I'm, I'm just saying semantics there. Anyway, he's back. And it says, afterward, he, Yeshua, appeared unto the eleven. That's the eleven apostles. As they sat, it says at meat, but it means they're eating. And he upbraided them with their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Because see, he's already been walking around, and people have seen him, and they tell him, and they don't believe it. See, we talk about faith, and we think we have strong faith, but these are the 11 who, like, staked everything on him. They all pretty much got martyred after this, too. I mean, they were warriors for the faith. And here's Yeshua coming back. Had to come all the way back from the dead just to chew him out. What are you guys doing? Why do you not believe? And so he's yelling at them. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believes... So, when he says, this is another thing, we can read it in Matthew 2, the Great Commission, right? Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. Who's he talking to? He's, he's talking to the apostles, right? The eleven. And he said, hey, go into all the world. I mean, that's just another interesting semantic thing. Well, yeah, he means it for us too. Uh, he's talking to the eleven. He could have appeared to his hundreds of disciples that were there. Um, that's just something to think about too. He says, go into all the world, but we want you to go preach the gospel and baptize people. And he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believes not shall be damned. Damned to what? Eternal death, right? Either believe and follow Yeshua or you don't. If you believe, you're saved. If you don't, you're damned. And then, these signs shall follow them that believe. And so that's everybody who believes, truly believes in Yeshua, you should expect to see these signs. What's that? Just always just right, but it's important. They shall, let me see, whoop. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out demons. It says devils in King James, but it's demons. Cast out demons. Many of us have done that. They shall speak with new tongues. Many of us have done that. They shall take up serpents. I've done that. Anybody here picked up poisonous snakes? You're still here? They, um... They shall drink any deadly thing, and it shall not hurt them. Here's my sister Kate joke that I won't make. But I don't know for a fact that I've ever drank poison. Has anybody here ever been poisoned? Like, tried to be poisoned? Somebody tried to poison you? Good. <laughs> Every day. And we're not sick. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now that's the people who believe. So these are powers that we should expect to see manifest in believers. Does, it, does Yeshua say that every believer will display every sign? No. He says these things we can expect to see from believers because that whole part about belief, and I'm not going there in this sermon, but belief is tied to faith and faith without works is dead and you've got this tree that bears fruit and this tree that doesn't. We cut down the tree that doesn't so we can make room for a tree that grows good fruit, right? I mean, we all get that. The action has to follow belief. It can't just be, well, I believe and there's absolutely no change. 
and there's no power. As Pastor Dallas Fonda is saying, there's no power. Where's the power? If there are not manifestations of power, um, it's time to start asking ourselves, what are we doing? It's time to start asking him, what's going on, Father? How come there's no power? Give me power. Give me your power, Father. Let me use it for your glory. And start praying for those things. These signs shall follow them that believe. The last one is they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Does it take an elder to lay hands on somebody so that they recover? No. Does it take a man to lay hands on somebody so that they recover? No. These are just signs of believers. I'm being led to go somewhere next week, which won't necessarily be in John. Um, and this is kind of a, a prelude to that. And so what I would like people to do is actually think about these signs that follow. Those that believe. Start thinking about that. Start. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot and make you get up and give a report. But you should have in your own mind, how have you seen this power manifested? How have you seen it manifested in others? How have you seen it manifested in yourself as these things have happened? And I think Janet Jackson said, what have you done for me lately? How have you seen it lately in others and in yourself? Because we're going to start getting into that a little bit. I'm just feeling led to go there. Um, so with that, yes, Yeshua raised Lazarus from the dead. That we know about, he raised two other people from the dead, you know, directly, specifically. So did Peter and Paul, so did Elijah and Elisha. Um, I submit, so can we be at the Father's will. His will, not our will. All right, let's pray.